Okay, back with you on the Bronx Buzz. And uh, before we get into a very serious and important segment, I need to say happy birthday to uh, our producer, Anderson Peguero. Uh, he turned, I don't, I don't even know how many years, a, a number of years, uh, but today is the day that he did that. So happy birthday and thanks for all your great work. Now, we get real serious and um, let's talk about the nurses' strike with the former president of the 42,000 member New York State Nurses Association. She's a 40-year nurse at Montefiore Medical Center. She's on the negotiating committee, so we know what's going on in there. Uh, nice to see you again, uh, Judy Sheridan Gonzalez. Hello. How are you doing? We're doing okay. Um, I'm, I'm happy that the, the strike is settled. I want to start with this, and you'll appreciate this. Many years ago, I could look up the date. Uh, former Borough President Freddie Ferrer was on my other program, Bronx Talk, and he had just come out. He had finished surgery, and he was well again. And I asked him on the show, um, you know, how are you doing? Are you okay? And the first thing he said was, I want to tell you something. Nurses are the greatest people in the world. And I remembered that. And anytime I've had to interact, then I said, you better be nice and you better be cool with the people who are the greatest people in the world. So thank you. And thank your colleagues for all that you do. How about that? Oh, that's really nice to hear. We've been hearing a lot of that lately and we appreciate it. Well, that's good. Um, so why did you go on strike? Um, I was talking in the previous segment about um, it's all about pain. It, it hurt you to go on strike. It hurt patients. Certainly the hospital didn't want to compromise health care or anything like that. It was pain all around. But why was it important to you to uh, take a stand? Well, there's been pain all around for a long time uh, at Montefiore, which used to have a wonderful reputation uh, and certainly enough staff to take care of our patients. There have been incredible cuts. Uh, COVID hurt us even more. And right now, our patients are not getting the care that they deserve. Uh, our, our ratios, our nurse to patient ratios are way too high. And um, our patients aren't treated the way the patients at Montefiore treats up in White Plains, for example. Uh, they're not treated the same way. <clears throat> our equipment, our equipment, our physical plant is worse. The ER overcrowding is horrendous. Patients are admitted to hallways on stretchers without any privacy, toilets, bathrooms, anything. Um, and the nurses are completely overwhelmed in the care for caring for our patients. <clears throat> that was the basis for our going on strike. Um, we weren't able to get the hospital to uh, honor the the numbers in our contract. And they were not uh, numbers of uh, uh, patients uh, per nurse. nurse? Nurse we have uh, in the contract ratios, like, for example, like class size, people are more familiar with right. class size. You're only allowed okay. to have 25 kids in a class. We're only supposed to have five patients, four patients, depending on where we were. And in the ER, we were caring for 15 or 20 patients, which was an impossibility. In addition, the patients were crowded together like sardines. And it was just not a humane way in which to take care of human beings. Hmm. Um, that's a you painted a rather difficult picture. Um, and then you said also you didn't quite get what you want. Are, are you completely dissatisfied or was there some compromise um, oh, uh, in the contract that we have now? Yes. Oh, no. We, we were able to address every issue, every issue that mattered. Uh, we we're really happy with with um, with what we were able to do, uh, enforcing the contract. We now have enforcement language with penalties, uh, disincentives for Montefiore to abuse the nurses and the patients, multiple disincentives and uh, incentives to hire nurses and keep nurses in the institution. So we're quite pleased. We see it as a beginning of repairing the hospital, uh, bringing it back to its former glory. Well, that, that I'm, I'm happy to hear that. One of the things that um, I brought up in the previous segment, and I'm curious about your perception of it, the COVID, number one, the nurses, of course, were um, among many heroes during that period of time. Did it exacerbate the problem? So number one, the hospitals were more likely to cut because money's dried up and weren't there. Um, and number two, Nurses said, you know what, I can't do this anymore. They worked under incredible pressure. I'm, I'm sorry to even consider that we probably lost some uh, due to the pandemic um, and that hurt numbers. Um, was the overall shortage made worse by the pandemic and then made people's emotions worse? So then they said, you know what, we got to do something. You know what I mean? I mean, did what did the pandemic contribute to um, this effort and to the desire to say enough is enough? 
Well, I think it was the fact that the hospitals didn't really work with the employees. They felt they knew better. And I think anyone in any profession or any job knows that the people who are actually doing the work know best what's needed. We knew what our patients needed. We knew what we needed. We certainly had a big fight about PPE. I think that's a household term now. Uh, we weren't given the protections that we needed. And we had approached the hospitals back in January prior to the pandemic going full force in March to work with us to try to prepare. Um, but typically they didn't listen to us. I think you will heard a lot of people saying, you're not listening, you're not listening. And that was a big theme in our, in our marches and in our pickets, mm. you know, listen to us, work with us, listen to us, um, because that wasn't happening. And that did exacerbate the problem. We were already under understaffed and Montefiore, instead of investing in patients and nurses, uh, invested in media and PR and in consultants, <clears throat> they used a very expensive consulting group called the McKinsey Group. I'm not sure how many listeners are aware of the McKinsey Group's role in the opioid e epidemic and all the many, many of the other problems were faced all over the world. They spent millions of dollars for things like that. We're their best consultants. They should consult with us. And, and that never happened. Hopefully that will change. Aside from that, I was just going to say that. So aside from the contract, do you think um, maybe the dialogue is better? Maybe you gain some commitment to partner and cooperate with the, with the nurses a little better? I mean, time will tell. We hope so. We think that the hospitals learned one thing. They can't possibly function without us. Um, that was a wake up call perhaps for them and that nurses are not willing to be abused anymore. We had a relationship uh, like a, a domestic violence relationship. We were abused partners and mm. uh, we struck back. Well, wow. that's an interesting uh, metaphor. Um, you know, when you um, you take a step back and, and look at at, um, uh, at the numbers of nurses, um, it's very easy to look and say, well, wait a minute, we've got whatever the number was, 7,000 nurses who went on strike. Um, we really need, in order to get the coverage that we want, we really need 8,000. I don't know what the numbers are. Um, and the fact is there's been a nursing shortage. Is there any sympathy f to that? Or though your suggestion was that they're spending money elsewhere and that maybe if they um, move some of that money to something else, they, you would yeah. be better. Or they, is the shortage really a big issue? They were purposely not hiring nurses. We just won an arbitration today oh. uh, that was filed in 2020 based on the fact uh, multiple reasons why we did did so poorly during the pandemic, one of which was they weren't hiring nurses and they were forced under oath to admit that they had 3,000 nurses in their pipeline wanting to get jobs at Montefiore that they did not hire during wow. COVID. Wow. 3,000. Mm -hmm. that, that is quite a revelation. Pretty bad. So there are nurses that are willing to work. There are nurses that want to work. They want to make sure that the conditions are better and they also need to be responded to. We were able to gain some things in the contract that we think will help Montefiore's uh, inept process of hiring and transferring. I can give you a hundred examples, which we did uh, during the arbitration. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're hoping that they put their efforts where they need to be and uh, develop efficiencies in hiring. Uh, that will make a big difference. Pursuant to the, <laughs> that's a legal term, pursuant to the um, question I just asked, um, the, the, the new building at Lehman College, uh, where BronxNet is located, as a matter of fact, uh, there's going to be a nursing building and a big nursing program. Uh, can we assume that you're happy about that and, and that may alleviate some of the um, a shortage, uh, nursing yes, shortage? Yes, uh, for years we've asked Montefiore to partner with the union to go and do presentations and recruitment in nursing schools. They refuse to do so. Uh, now in our contract, there is an agreement to, to work together. Wow. Yep. So, sounds like you're very pleased with um, the, the deal, overall deal. I don't want to repeat on ourselves. Paper, but... On paper, we're very pleased. Uh, you and, know that the devil's in the details. And and, and also in the enforcement of it and the, the application of it. Um, also curious about, now I realize that you're focused on um, Montefiore Medical Center. I'm also curious about um, uh, other hospitals. Was, was Is the theme the same? Um, did, for example, Mount Sinai, which was the other hospital that was last in, so to speak, um, did they have similar problems or do the problems um, that you have articulated uh, uh, transfer from one to the other? 
I mean, there's different situations. We have safety net hospitals that are not academic, you know, well-renowned academic medical centers. We have academic medical centers that don't have the same safety net issues that we have here. Um, but Montefiore should do a lot better. Uh, it's not like a hospital like Brooklyn Hospital or Interfaith, which were bankrupt. Montefiore is clearly not bankrupt. It's the way they decide to spend their money, uh, invest in real estate, invest in other areas. For example, they closed the Grand Con Concourse um, facility and uh, we're investigating opening up a concierge service in Hudson Yards. That doesn't serve our Bronx community. They invest and put a lot of energy and money into White Plains Hospital, but not in our Bronx facilities where we have such an underserved population. We think the priorities of the medical center need to change. They do get federal funding. Um, they've, they are gonna work with us to, in, <laughs> to get more programs for the Bronx. They say they need money. We were thinking of doing a GoFundMe to get Montefiore money so it could invest in the Bronx. If we have to do that, we will. But uh, we think that the Bronx deserves much better than what they're getting. Uh, you and I have known each other for a very long time. Uh, I'm going to ask you an unfair question if you don't want to answer. So you got something nice you want to say about Montefiore Medical Center? Just something that you that that you say, you know what, this is good? The nurses and the doctors, <laughs> the caregivers are amazing. I stepped right into it. <laughs> they are amazingly wonderful human beings who go out of our way, go well beyond to take care of our patients in spite mm -hmm. of the of the lack of resources. Right. And maybe, maybe now, I mean, you know, I always try to be hopeful. Maybe now um uh, you know, they'll get a better chance to do that. Um, uh, any final things that I didn't ask you about that you wanted to mention? Because we did well, pretty good here. I, I mean, I think the bottom line is the uh, fact that healthcare is a dysfunctional system. It's a for-profit system. As you know, uh, we are very much in support of the New York Health Act and legislation to create a single-payer type of system where patients can get what they need, not based on their income, not based on their zip code, but based on the fact that healthcare is a human right a human need. And as a society, we should be providing that. I think that's the overarching element here. I, I took a look at the last time you were on Bronx Talk and we did talk about health insurance. And as I recall, we held up a bill that none of the three people, including me and you, and there was a, a health advocate could figure out what it actually meant. I'd love to square that away. I mean, maybe the Health Act will do that. That'd be great. Listen, uh, Judy Sheridan Gonzalez, first of all, thank you for taking care of, of people in the Bronx and, and being a, a nurse for 40 years. And also thank you for helping to solve what was a big problem and hopefully it will be solved um, to the betterment of all in the future. And appreciate your time this evening. Sure. Thanks for having, having Great. us. Uh, folks, uh, that will do it. Once again, happy birthday to Anderson. Uh, I don't know. I don't even know if I'm invited to the party or whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, but, um, you know, what? Uh, thanks to um, Bahar and thanks to Judy and We'll see you next week. Good night.